Hello everyone, welcome back to the Craft and Business of Books with me, Tatiana Denford. And I'm Marissa Hussey. So this is the show that gives you the tools, the tricks, the stumbling blocks to the writing process, but also Marissa and I are just trying to show everyone the behind the scenes um, on the industry side. So um, from the authors sharing their process to the, the nuts and bolts of how the industry works and everything in between, we're trying to make the book world a little bit less scary for you guys. Uh, we are on every Friday at 2 p.m. Eastern, so make sure to click the link below to subscribe and be alerted ahead of every episode. Right, today we are comparing fiction and nonfiction. So yeah, let's talk about that. So we're, when you are a fiction writer and a nonfiction writer, right, you have particularly particular challenges uh, both as a writer to switch gears between the two. Um, and then also for publishers, right? Publishers approaching authors who do both because lots of people do both. <laughs> um, you know, many writers first make headway in nonfiction as ghostwriters or co-writers or journalists. And, you know, that works as stepping stones to fiction work or sometimes fiction writers find that once they really exist in that muscle, that, you know, writing on nonfiction topics is something that they're drawn to. It might also pay the bills more consistently. So, <laughs> um, Tatiana, from a writing perspective, how do you switch between the two on the writing level, but also on like a presentation and branding level? From for me and kind of my journey with the two. Um, <clears throat> now, I don't have a nonfiction book out yet. I say that because I'm currently doing a nonfiction proposal, but I can see right now uh, the way it feels it's a very different energy so um when i write in fiction i can kind of hide behind the characters however there is more energy that i spend in creating those characters and there's almost i, I put more pressure on myself um when i was writing motherland uh, even though they weren't well they were based on real people but they were still it was fictionalized so mm -hmm. Um, it was, I mean, writing a book is exhausting anyway, but I think in particular, I think fiction compared to nonfiction, I feel is a little bit like the, there's way, there's a different energy. There's, there's more time spent kind of creating environments and characters with nonfiction. And I've written articles, so you could say, so that's, you know, classified as nonfiction. So I've written articles for, you know, and I've, I am, I am now kind of detailing the behind the scenes stuff mm -hmm. of my so that's nonfiction um, and writing up a proposal in nonfiction that's um, to me it feels easier in a way mm -hmm. there's less thought behind how these worlds are going to work it's more my voice and I feel a bit more honest mm -hmm. so I feel a bit more confident in that ability I'm not saying that I am the world's best writer not in that sense I'm saying that I can approach it with a much more confident uh, right. voice. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, I mean, I just, I just think, how do publishers deal with, you know, authors that do both? How do they, you know, package them up? Or is that something they just kind of say, like, you're free to do whatever, just let us know which direction you're going to go in? I mean, of course, you know, authors are, you know, you're tied to a publisher for a work. Uh, you know, or maybe maybe two or three, obviously, depending on what your contract says. But that's, you know, they, they don't define your career, right? And if you choose to do something as a writer that's different, you know, they, they've, they've got a role with that. Um, so it's, but it is a slightly different beast to present someone as one or the other when they've made a name for themselves already in one arena, right? So I've worked with lots of historians, for example, you know, who've gone on to write fiction, you know, or authors who have had plays published in, in book form. Um, and it can be a challenge to present a new kind of work to customers who have become quite familiar with a person doing one kind of work, um, especially when all they see is a book cover in a shop sometimes. Yeah. Um, you know, for example, if the person is on television or their work is published, you know, on, on a website, there are more, you know, context clues there for, for a customer to pick up that, oh, this is different. This is a, this is a, a shift from, from what it means to from this person. But in a bookshop or a supermarket, it can be quite confusing uh, when there's no one there to explain that this is different from, you know, what, what this writer has normally done. Yeah. Particularly because publishers often want there to be an element of confusion because they, they, well, they don't, they would call it that, of course, but they want the customer to liken 
the work and they, you know, to, to what they're familiar with and they want them to go in a second. Oh, you know, I know. Oh, okay. I know this person. Um, if there is no other, no other clue than a visual, you know, cover image. Um, but it's a very tricky straddle and yeah. it's done unsuccessfully. So, but today I think we have a guest who has done this to great success. Um, someone who has chosen publishers for fiction work and nonfiction work very well and clearly has a fantastic personal strategy, strategy sorry, um, around how she presents herself as a writer of both. Yeah, I think I, my perspective is that Court, Courtney is everywhere in the sense that she, <laughs> um, and she kind of straddles it really well because her writing is really consistent. And I think both in fiction and non-fiction, I think that, like you were saying, that you want somebody to recognize the author rather than necessarily the work. And I think when you when you think about Courtney and her body of work, that's, you know, she's, you can find her everywhere. That's somebody that's kind of really quite malleable in, you know, she will tell a story, no matter if it's fiction or non-fiction, she'll tell it well and really engage with the reader. There's no, um, there's no break. In, yep. In comparison, so I think that's that's quite that's a great skill. Yeah, absolutely. So, on that note, hello. Oh my goodness, you're both too generous. I'm really I'm gonna have to lean on my um, fiction writing skills to pretend that I have a personal brand strategy. <laughs> <laughs> so let's see how it goes. But thank you for your your generous comment. Let's do the PowerPoint presentation, Courtney. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, Courtney, I'm going to introduce you in a li little more detail now while you are here awkwardly watching me do it. Good. Um, <laughs> Courtney has authored several books that you may have heard of, um, including two fiction novels. I'm having so much fun here without you, which I love. I love that title. Um, and Touch, uh, as well as a nonfiction guide to publishing called Before and After the Book Deal, A Writer's Guide to Finishing, Publishing, Promoting, and Surviving Your First Book. Um, she has had some of these published with very traditional publishers, right, such as Penguin Random House, and Simon and & Schuster, and others published with independent, independent presses, such as Catapult, including her most recent book, Costa Ligra. Did I say that correctly? Costa Ligra. Costa Ligra. Close. I, I should have checked beforehand. Um, <laughs> so that was published with Tin House and was just released in paperback. Um, so, Courtney, you are a maelstrom of knowledge in, in <laughs> the publishing industry and incredibly active in the writing and publishing community, and we are really glad to have you talk about Today. Thank you. I'm I'm really happy to be here. <laughs> yeah, welcome. And I, you know, uh, this is like such a great conversation to have with you in particular because we are trying to approach it from you know a position where we just want the industry to be slightly less opaque from both sides. And you've actually managed to create a book that interviews so many authors exactly, and it's. I mean, it's wonderful. That kind of conversation just needs to happen more and more because I think a lot of people recently I've seen, you know, a lot of people get a lot out of it. So I'm super excited. Um, Thank you. Yeah, I I felt the book needed to exist because it didn't exist. So mm -hmm. I'm really happy. And it does, it does seem like people are, um, people agree with me. They find it necessary, I think. So I'm happy. Yeah. <laughs> Yay. Right. So um, what are you working on right now? Well, actually, it's it's perfect, quite perfect that we're all talking today because I am at this moment waiting to find out what one of my editors thinks of a memoir that I've written that my agent has passed on. I have word has come down that she has finished it and wants to talk. So I'm waiting <laughs> to hear about that. And then in the meantime, I'm um, I'm actually doing book coaching. Um and editing other people's work and, you know, thinking about the fall, whether or not I have to organize some sort of emergency teacher pod and, you know, all the things that that, uh, that creative professionals are dealing with right now, especially those with children. So, so panic, it's panic at the disco, really. <laughs> you, make it, you make it look very seamless though. So, you know, that's, <laughs> um, you know, what, by the way, like the memoir sounds exciting, so I'm I'm super excited for you about that. Um, uh, how, when we talk about like I come 
at it from a process perspective and a creative perspective. So I just, I'd love to know what things kind of, how do you get inspired to write? Where are the moments where you think, right, this is going to develop into a story? And to like, to further that question, if you can explain when you hit on a seed, is that going to go kind of into fiction or nonfiction? How do you make that decision? Hmm. That's a, that, I mean, that's a big question, right? But I keep um, a running list of ideas, which unfortunately is not as organized or findable as I would like it to be because some of it is in a Gmail file to myself. Some are scribbled in my actual diary. I still keep like a diary. Some are written down on my agenda and I keep every week I start with a to-do list and I keep meaning to morph them all into one. Oh, I also have a Google Doc. <laughs> I keep meaning to morph them all into one list, but I haven't done it yet. So but I do have a list and they're completely they're It's almost like a bullet point thing with just things that inspire me that I could maybe turn into something one day. Um, but unfortunately my process, what it has end up, ended up looking like, like I, I used to think of myself in my twenties as someone who got an idea and went with it, whether it was a short story or a full length uh, book project, I just wrote it. And I think people from afar might look at my career and, and think that that's still my process because I, you know, I've published quite a few books in, in not a very large amount of time. But, but the truth is I'm finding I've got this like seven year cycle where I'll have an idea and either it takes a lot of time to, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Filtrate, I guess. Um, or it's just bad luck and good luck. Like with my first novel, I'm having so much fun here without you. That book was, you know, quote unquote, done in um, 2003, I think, 2004. But it didn't come out for 10 years. Yeah. There was an editor who left her job. Um, I changed agents. The project just died. And it, it was truly resurrected 10 years later. And then with, with my um, latest novel, Costa Alegre, you know, this book, it, it seemed like the idea came out of nowhere, but in fact, I, I wrote a, um, and published a chat book called Notes from Mexico, which was published maybe in 2011, which takes place in the, in the same exact place. Mm -hmm. um, so in that case, it was a, it's a part of Western Mexico that's like a muse to me. And so that also had, was like a seven, eight year uh, trajectory. So when it comes, however, to deciding whether something's going to be fiction or nonfiction, um, honestly, it's, it's just for me about, I mean, sometimes I know, sometimes you just know there might be no other way to get at a story than through fiction, um, or th through nonfiction. Um, but often I find like with Costa Alegre, I thought that was going to be a memoir and I started writing it and through the writing of it, <laughs> I realized what I actually wanted to be writing about, which was something completely different. And that happened with my second novel, Touch. That started off as fiction, but a completely different book. Yeah. And through many, many drafts, and unfortunately, I'm talking about full length drafts. I wish I could say it was, you know, 30 pages, or, but often I'll write the entire project. And it's not until I have an entire book length manuscript. And I'm, of course, like most writers, I'm filled with the sensation that this is an incredible work that can basically go straight to an editor. Yeah. <laughs> it goes to my agent, obviously, and then her job is, it always plays out the same way. She's always like, oh, the first three chapters, they're just amazing. Like, you can't believe you did this, it's so great. And then it's silence for weeks and weeks oh, no. and weeks. <laughs> and the project's gone off the rails because yeah. um, it's very hard to sustain momentum unless you really, really know what you're talking, what you're writing about and whether you know what the conflicts are, and this is for nonfiction and fiction. And unfortunately, I find I need to write these entire things to find out what that nugget is. Yeah. And then I go back in and I go back in. So I call them verbal sketches, the things that I do to just sketch out different voices and points of views. And um, I think I had, that's how I ended up with this memoir. I'd, I'd written a book, um, um, that it literally it was the same thing. The first three chapters, my agent was like, I think we can send this right onto the editor. And then it went off the rails. And, and that book, I quite liked it, but I realized that it, it was supposed to be a memoir, you know? And so that's, that's how I ended up with this memoir that's in limbo right now. But um, yeah, it's trial and error, really. Yeah. <laughs> 
And I think, you know, we were talking to another author who said that it's re it never really changes. It doesn't matter how many books you have under your belt. There's always that period of where you write out all the sludge. Everything has to kind of come out and you can't be too hard on yourself doing that because that's eventually you kind of chip away at it and then the, the kind of the center, the heart of it is there. Yeah, it's it's not a very attractive process. I mean, I I was luck with before and after the book deal. That book just came out. I didn't have the kind of struggles that I had with other books. Um, but it it doesn't. It for for me, it's a plot. You know, uh, plot just takes a lot of work. Most writers, I think, if you have ten writers in a room, probably ten of them really struggle with the momentum and stamina and maintaining a plot throughout their books, regardless of whether it's a commercial or, or literary project, it's just, it's very, very hard to yeah. plot. Mm -hmm. And that's yeah. why thankfully we're allowed to revise, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and do you, um, when you kind of sit down, you know kind of you're working on your, your next book or, um, I know that you're a mother and you obviously there's that there's like a part of your brain that's taken up with kind of responsibilities and stuff how do you carve out time or do you take them in little snippets are you an early morning person are you you know how do you find that um i'm a big 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 believer in energy management and energy assessment so i sort of have my creative energy output down to a science and i'm i'm always at my most productive um, Mondays and Tuesdays. So normally in non-COVID times, mm -hmm. I block off Monday. And this is, you know, um, this is if my daughter's healthy and she's in school and there is school and everything's normal. Uh, mm -hmm. Mondays and Tuesdays, I block off entirely for my own creative writing. Um, I don't look at emails normally, like we're having this call today on a Tuesday, but normally I don't schedule anything on Tuesdays, including social commitments so that on Mondays and Tuesdays, I can access that very important gift of, of like feral writing time, yeah. just knowing that it doesn't matter. Like it doesn't matter at the end of the day, all we have to eat are noodles. It doesn't matter if the house looks like hell, if I look like hell, it doesn't matter. I'll put an out of office on my inbox. Um, if someone really needs to reach me, they're going to reach, they're going to find a way to reach me, you know, but, but I can, then I, you know, I mean, my daughter's at school from eight 30 to three 30. That's a pretty good amount of time to get lost in, especially if you know, you have another day right after it. Mm -hmm. And then Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, I kind of jigger around um, other responsibilities. I mean, I have freelance work and things like that. And if I can come back to the writing project, then I will. But normally uh, I write so much on Mondays and Tuesdays that I'm, out, I'm almost happy to move on to something else. And then something else I've done that I find is really helpful is I take a true weekend. I don't, I, I, to the extent I can control for it, I don't work on the weekends. I'll think maybe a little bit about projects, but um, I don't do any conscious work. And that way, when I wake up on Monday, I am really ready for that sort of the binging of the yep exclusive devotion to, to one project. And that I've been doing now for um, probably three years. And it's really serves me very, very well. And of course, it helps me control against, you, you know, fruitless wasted time on social media and things like that. And people respect it too. You know, if you put up an out of office or, or just people know, you know, I, I mean, I just, I, Sometimes I'll get texts from friends and I can tell that they want to talk. And I mean, unless they're having a true crisis, yeah, yeah. I say like, these are my writing days and you know, I'll respond later. And you just, you, you have to respect your own boundaries and then other people will. And obviously that's going to help you. And, yeah. you know, regarding my child, she knows what I do. My husband's a filmmaker. She, she's only six, but she gets it. And, yeah. um, you know, I try to involve her in the process when I can go into book signings and reading so she can see that mommy's not just sitting around, you know, typing on a computer that this, this goes towards something. And, uh, yeah. she, you know, as she keeps asking me like, wait, mama, are you famous? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's good, but I mean, I'm, I'm very lucky. I have, um, you know, a, a partner in the childcare, 
Mm-hmm. Uh, for the most part, I have a healthy child. Um, yeah. The school's right here. I mean, things are very different right now because who knows what's happening with school. But, um, you know, I save a lot of money for childcare, to be honest. Um, that's really important. So I don't feel guilty when I'm writing mm-hmm. at all, which I think is, part. Uh, you know, some people some people do, but um, I don't. It's important that I do what, what I love. It makes me a better mother. I think, you know, uh, you touched on a lot of great points there, especially with the guilt. I think a lot of people feel guilty for creating art, for writing, for, because even if I read once where somebody said that reading for a writer is still work because reading kind of you unlocks kind of that one thing that you need in order to kind of get over a block that you have potentially. So sometimes I think people see somebody, you know, if you're yeah. reading, the, the judgment is there like, oh, how nice for you. But also the, the, the person who's reading, who is the writer going like, yeah, but I should, like, this is terribly indulgent. Should I be, you know, so there's that. But also, you know, when we talk about boundaries, especially with women, the conversations with women creating boundaries, it's such a difficult thing. So to be able to be so disciplined is great. And I think you should write a book about this because I think we all need this. <laughs> I'm, so I'm much- very big on discipline. I mean, I, I probably could write maybe a pamphlet on that. But it's funny what you said. So my husband being a filmmaker, you know, he'll watch movies in the middle of the day, which yes. does seem terribly indulgent, but that's work for him. And um yeah i mean no i love discipline <laughs> that is so and i so much of what you said just resonated so so deeply because especially the you know what, what you said about you know having noodles at the end of the day i i just like kind of blew something up in my head because uh. it's just like I, you get so you or you can i think and especially for me i'm still in you know quite early you know, motherhood, I think. And that's still something that I have not been able to do. So here, let me help everyone um, <laughs> on our call. So this is like, this is how you elevate any meal. You need to have Japanese soba noodles. Um, if you can't get them in your grocery store, you can order them online. Um, a very good sesame oil, high mm-hmm. quality. And then always have on hand, I find some feta mm-hmm. and some kind of vegetable. It, it can't, it doesn't matter. And you can make a meal in four minutes. The soba noodles take four minutes to cook. Mm -hmm. And even if you only have a cucumber, as long as you have the feta and some soy sauce and some sesame oil, put everything on a plate Mm -hmm. and chop it up and then fry an egg and put that on top. It's quite good. It looks pretty. (laughs) It's not crap. You know, it's full of nutrients and it, it, it does not, I mean, from the boiling water to the dish, it takes Mm -hmm. six or seven minutes. So, Mm -hmm. um, yeah, noodles are great. <laughs> <laughs> I think my, my version of noodles is like not having a tidy kitchen, you know, like it would, Oh, know. no, my kitchen has like things growing in it. I just oh, don't care. Like, like, yeah. <laughs> you know, there are going to be two days a week that it's going to be like that. And then, yeah. you know, you can get on with what, what you need to do. So I, it was really. Can I just say that I think if everybody adopted that way of working, whether you're writing, whether you, if you can, to create certain boundaries where, you know, like what's your time worth? And right. if you make that make that very clear and other people start doing it. God, what a I mean, what an amazing way of working. Not only does that protect your energy, but then you kind of like make somebody else feel better because then they think, oh, okay, well, actually, I can then it's a domino effect, isn't it? Then it affects other people's energy. It affects other people. And I, I tell there's a section on like discipline in this book and um I, I, I suggest to people that you actually do monetize your time uh-huh. because then you'll be less likely if someone texts you. And like I mentioned, if, if it seems like they really need to talk, well, maybe you go and make that phone call or maybe you get a notification and you go down the rabbit hole of social media. But if your time is monetized and if you say, you know, my, my hourly is worth $75 or something, well, and then really do some, I don't know whether you're putting money in a jar or you're taking it out of a, you do something just to train your brain to say, no, stop, this can actually wait three hours until I'm done with my writing time. And I think the example I use in the, in the book is, you know, it takes a really long time to get a dermatologist appointment. So the day you finally get that appointment and it comes around, it's 1 p.m., you're, you're not gonna go do laundry, right? You're going to go to the dermatologist appointment and that is what you're doing, not gonna pick up a phone call. And, and so 
Why? Because it takes a long time to get that appointment and it's worth it to you and you have some problem you need to fix. Well, you have to respect your, your writing in the same way. And truly, it doesn't take very long of you not respecting your own time for the people around you to not respect it either. Right. And if they don't respect your boundaries, well, then everyone's coming into you. If you ha live with other people, people are coming into your office physically or into your life virtually. And the, the porousness um, is completely... I, I, that I'm at the end of my uh, metaphors with <laughs> biology. <laughs> it's just, it's just, no. <laughs> There's, and that whose fault is that? Well, it's your fault, actually. Yeah. yeah. You know, I mean, you can, again, for those who have children, not all the time, but some, you really can train your children to oh, yeah. respect the fact that you work from home. And when the door is closed, it's truly closed. That's you right. know, and no, you can't get up and make a, uh, a sandwich, you know, yeah. because you're trying to figure out your character's motivation. <laughs> exactly. Oh, I wonder if that would work if I said that to my kids. You can now have a snack because I'm trying to figure out my character's motivation. <laughs> I mean, I find I, with my daughter, it works better if we talk about like the villain, like, mm -hmm. you know, who the villain is or stuff. But I do try to talk to her about, um, you know, narrative elements and whatnot so she can kind of get into the whole thing. But She's very good. I mean, I, I think it helps maybe that I have one child, but um, she's she's been great, really great about yeah. it. That's great. I love I love sort of the idea of bringing your you know bringing your child into into your career. And <laughs> I realized the other day it was the first time I'd ever said I had ever told my child what that I like what I did for work. And oh. all I could get it was mommy works with computers. I was, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I mean, for a three-year-old, I guess that was probably good. <laughs> yeah, you're getting there. I mean, you, know, you make up, you make up world. I mean, yeah, you just you find a way. I mean, I went in. I was going to say you find a way to describe it in a language that is exciting to them. I I went in um, when my daughter was in kinder, first grade, I guess. So last year, um, I went in to talk to the kids about how if you love to read, you can eventually turn it into a career. And I brought in little books that I wrote when I was about seven years old that are kind of encased in wallpaper and then showed them, um, you know, actual published books and then translated versions of them, you know, yeah. in, in um, languages that I don't speak and can't read. And, you know, they, they thought that was pretty cool. But then the first hand that shot up was a little boy and he said, I couldn't believe this. He said, have any of your books been turned into movies? <laughs> <laughs> God, 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 Jesus. That's the level that people look for nowadays. It's like I know. I was like, take it down a notch, buddy. But um, you know, that was cool for them to see. I don't know. I think it's exciting. I think I th but I certainly I really do believe that you're doing yourself a favor if you can get your family and friends to respect your your creative process enough that they want to help you protect your your artistic time, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'm gonna ask you some questions about your your publishing experience now, right? And particularly what you look for in partners, right? From agents to publishers and their support staff. So when you have fiction and nonfiction work to sell, you know, are there any strengths that you're looking for in one and not the other? Or is, you know, is more critical than in one than the other? Well, you know, there's the question of money, I think comes mm -hmm. first. Um, that's sort of the question is like, is this something that can earn me, you know, more serious money or is this kind of an artistic project? Um, and if the question is, you know, if, if, if the question of real money is on the table, well then, then the partnership is about, okay, well, who can do this in a way where my work feels respected and I feel respected and our working styles align um, how much will be asked of me and my time? And then if it's about a more artistic project, mm -hmm. well, it's, I mean, it's the same, but you know, who will make this look really good? The pay, there have to be different payoffs. If you're not going to get a big advance, um, you know, are you getting like street cred? Are they going to make the book or the essay look beautiful? Um, what's the exposure going to be? You know, does the potential partner have a m big following on a, online that is, that is actually engaged? Um, can they help give you any introductions um, to places or, you know, is there anything extra I can get out of this? For example, 
for my past two books. They're both with Indies, Catapult, and Tin House, and they both both have a workshop division. So it was enticing to me that I could potentially teach um, right. under the banners of, of both these publishers. And they have, um, you know, Catapult has a literary magazine. And um, also, I do think that there's, will I enjoy working with these people? You know, what is their working manner like? Mm -hmm. um, for example, uh, with Tin House, with Costa Alegre, my, my editor there, Maisie, we just had such lovely phone conversations. Mm -hmm. You know, I really liked that. It made it feel very intimate. Whereas with my first two books, um, same editor for those, a woman named Sally Kim, it was just like having a, an entire family, the force they, that they put behind those books and the level of faith and also resources was just like, wow, what a tremendous way to launch a career. But I mean, I have to say that like my career path is not necessarily exemplary in terms of brand building. It's a lot easier if you stay with one public, I mean, for your books, especially, it's a lot easier if you stay with one publisher. And if, as, as you were saying, you know, if a reader can go in and say, okay, well, I know, um, I know what to expect from a uh, Kevin Wilson book or Emma Straub, mm -hmm makes it a lot easier to sell and market those books. I haven't made it very easy for myself because I have projects that are slightly different in, in you know, tonality and scope. Yeah. Um, so the pros of that are, are that I now have worked with, you know, four different publishers, the big five and the, the yeah. indies. And I have, a, I think a very nice, uh, you know, sphere of, of, of contacts and also just experience with working with different people in different budgets. But the cons are that, you know, if you don't have a book in the pipeline with one publisher, they'll be less likely to promote your backlist with them. Mm -hmm. right. um, so that, that can come to hurt you. And of course, when a, when a, someone walks into a bookstore in a world in which we can do that, you know, with more ease than today, yeah. um, you know, they might, someone who who knew me from I'm having so much fun here without you yeah. might be surprised hopefully pleasantly so by Costa Alegre which is historical fiction mm -hmm. and ditto someone who read before and after the book deal might be surprised to that I have romantic comedies in my I don't know or maybe not or maybe maybe they think it's more seamless than I do but it's um yeah it's not it's it's not it's, I think it's easier if if you stay within a very comprehensible brand, but I just don't, I, I find that claustrophobic feeling. I have, um, I, I'm like a trained copywriter. I've worked for mm -hmm. over two decades as a copywriter and uh, I'm just used to writing in all different voices about all different things. And I find that incredibly pleasurable. I like challenge mm -hmm. and I just, I think it's really fun to try new things. And um, I intend to try like everything. I. I'd really like to do some erotica <laughs> um, at some point. I don't think I have it in me to do a thriller. I'm not good enough with plot, but um, you know, I, I've got this memoir now. I just, I, I just love writing. So I don't, I don't want to only do this one thing over and over because I bore myself. <laughs> yeah. I wonder if the team that, that you're with or anybody who's worked with you will understand that and I hope this will make sense. Your cons the consistency with who you are <laughs> is the not, you don't have to be linear. I think you, you are so eclectic. I think, you know, you learning so much about your own process and yourself and, you know, what you like and what you don't like, you're constantly learning. That is your consistency, if you know what I mean. So I think that people who really get you will get that that is the stuff that kind of keeps you moving. You know? Yeah, I think I found that to be true. And, you know, the one thing is that I've never left a publisher. I mean, my first book was, was with Simon & Schuster, but the second one came out with um, Putnam at Penguin Random House simply because I followed my editor there. Mm -hmm. right. And then we would have worked together on Costa Alegre, except it just didn't make sense in the Putnam list. It was a mm -hmm. little, you know, it, it just wasn't commercial enough for their list. But we stay in touch. We're friends. You know, we've been talking about something that, that I can do for her. And then at Tin House, before we even, you know, signed the contract, they had said we would love to be a house 
where Courtney can place her more artistic work. I mean, I think that that's an incredible privilege, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so I think of, I really do think of all these different publishers and editors as partners. And, and my goal is to have, yes, have us all working together, really. I mean, I, there was a wonderful evening I had, um, I guess in January, when I was on actual tour for Before and After the Book Deal, where I was in Portland and I had a dinner and half of the table was Catapult for Before and After the Book Deal and half was Tin House because I was promoting both books at Powell's. Yeah. And they all came to dinner and I just thought, God, this feels like a real feat, you know, and, and it's just a beautiful show mm -hmm. of support from these two independent um, um publishers who, and I don't think honestly that that would have happened at the big five level. And I just thought that was awesome. I think that's, it's, it's so far been a very positive experience. I mean, I really like collaboration, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, so my hope is to kind of keep going back to each editor with a project that makes sense for them and um, have, you know, three pillars of support really, which is a nice, mm -hmm. nice way to go forward. Hopefully it'll work. <laughs> really great perspective. I, I love it. And I think you, you said a lot of the things I thought that you might say <laughs> on the other side, you know, and, and working with authors who are, who have done, you know, something similar. It's, you know, it's a different set of challenges from, you know, having obviously the, you know, someone's entire list. Yeah. Um, but I also feel like it allows you to kind of focus on the author as author. Um, and, you know, and you as a writer and what that means, you know, rather than specifically on one kind of book. And, you know, it actually doesn't, it helps from pigeonholing people as a very specific kind of writer. And I think, you know, certainly if that's what you want from your career, that, you know, that all ends up working out. Um, so I am, yeah, it leads me to my final question, which is, you know, about, um, you know, your, I know you just said that you don't, you don't, you know, you don't think that you do much personal branding, right? Um, but, you know, how do you sort of separate you as author from your, you know, your work, right? In, you know, in other words, is there a difference in how you present? My right. work, my creative work or like? Yeah. Yeah. I just, you like in terms of having your website, right? Your social media presences, all of the things that you do supporting the work that you oh. publish, you know, how, how do you sort of straddle the? I don't, I think I straddle it by not straddling. Like <laughs> something I don't, a lot of people on social media, you know, it's very specific. Like, um, you know, on Twitter, they only tell jokes. They might not, mm -hmm be supporting the work of other people or, you know, and on Instagram, it's only photos of food or, you know, they're hyper specific. Mm -hmm. And while I understand that that helps build, you know, audience and platform, I don't have the time, you know? So like if I'm on Twitter and I want to show my food or I'm on Instagram and I want to share what I'm reading, I just, I just don't think it's all glommed together. So I don't really think that there's a separation. Yeah. Um, of me as author and me as my creative work, because ultimately all of my books, all of the novels, everything I've written is about the creative process. I'm someone who's very, very interested in the um, making of art. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I get it. I've worked in branding and marketing for so many years. I just had a kind of an argument with a friend of mine about this. He's like, I don't understand you, you know, are employed to tell other people how to build brands, but then you don't do your own, you don't build your own following the rules that you know to work. And I'm mm -hmm. like, well, I, <laughs> I get that. Yeah, I just, yeah. I don't. Um, it's much easier to give somebody else advice than give yourself advice. That's just a, that's a, yeah. Well, what am I going to limit my, first of all, I have a terrible phone that's really outdated and takes terrible pictures and I'm in a standoff with Apple, I do not want to up, like I, I try to go with their products as, until they literally break down. So I refuse to upgrade. So my photos are all terrible. And what am I gonna take pictures of? You know, only me, like I get it. Okay, my Instagram could just be writing tips and I'd probably have a lot more followers than I do. But well, then I need what, a separate account with fun photos of my kid? I mean, I just, who, I do not have time to keep everything so divided. I salute the people that do. Um, but then in terms of division, I mean, 
my private time is mine. That's the other thing. I don't think I want too many followers. I don't want to be bothered by notifications all the live long day. Then I, I mean, already as it is, I have things that seep in and they affect my creative process. Yeah. So my goal is not to be an influencer. My goal is to keep writing books. So um, I just figure that the readers will decide what my brand is, or that's my publisher's job. I'm just going to keep being myself and we'll see. I mean, so far, you know, I've got four books, so I don't think it's going no. too, too badly. <laughs> Do you know what's funny is that I know so many people who are like, I can create without worrying about what my platform is on social media. There's no, you know, I think you have to be authentic to how you work. And it's not, you know, I think there's such a, there's a, no, I don't want to use the word danger, but it's so easily, it, sorry, you can be very easily seduced into thinking, a lot of people are into thinking, well, you know, it's Pavlovian, you like the, the attention, you like the likes, and you like the followers, and that will progress your career. But actually, what's sustainable, yeah. I think, is the work. That's for itself, you know? Absolutely, I mean, but I think I'd, I'd be remiss to not say that there is a tremendous pressure these days. I mean, I have the fortune of having already published yeah. a little bit before it became a huge thing to have a platform. So I was very lucky. Uh, it is worth saying that many, many people today, writers, especially in the nonfiction land, yeah. are being flat out told, you have a great proposal, we can't buy it because you don't have enough of a platform. So the, um, the impetus to have a platform, whatever that means, a large Twitter following, Instagram following, whatever the hell, is absolutely there. Yeah. And I can't say in good faith that like, it doesn't matter that, that that's a level of, you know, a privilege. Yeah. Um, it, 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 it does matter for a lot of people who are trying to get to the gatekeepers. But what, what I always tell people is just take a beat and think a little bit because this platform building, a lot of people think automatically it's either Twitter or Instagram, but take time and identify what do you really care about what could you write about passionately mm. and be unpaid for and the more niche it is the better so if you're super yeah. into bird watching yeah. maybe you start a, a newsletter you know it, it doesn't have to be twitter like i i have a newsletter and i get a tremendous amount of enjoyment from that and a lot of engagement with people and um that to me is a it, it's a place I don't earn any money from it, but I, I really like engaging with my readers and I find that there there's true engagement there. Um, Instagram, I mean, Instagram's just fun. Twitter's, you know, where I try to be funny and, but, but, um, but yeah, anyway, uh, platform, does it matter? Well, yeah. yes, unfortunately it does, unless you've written, you know, the great American novel that everyone's <laughs> at auction for, but, it doesn't mean you need to be everywhere and it doesn't mean that you need to be there against your will. Mm -hmm. And if you know that you're going to be mis miserable on Instagram, well, guess what? You will be miserable, no yeah. doubt. And everyone's going to watch you being miserable. Uh -huh. no, you so can don't do that. Exactly. Um, you have uh, made me feel good because you've just done all the things I always say. It's <laughs> comfortable there and you don't enjoy it. It's going to show and people are going to know. And it, it does show and it's so awkward. And then, it, you know, what it does is it just turns people away from buying your books. Yeah. Where, you know, you might think it's really dorky, but if you have, um, I don't know, TikTok or something dedicated to sharpening pencils, I don't know what the hell. I don't even really know what TikTok is. But yeah. Is it dance moves? Well, whatever the hell, <laughs> your 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 passion's gonna show through, and people are gonna want to follow you simply because people like to watch people being happy and doing their their passionate thing. So, don't go where you don't want to be because it's just gonna take it's gonna zap energy that you could be using on your writing, and and who knows, it could be taking energy away from the novel that you were gonna write that was actually gonna be a big success, and you never get it written because you're so depressed on on Twitter. Yeah, no, exactly. I think Marissa, I think Courtney said like a really great thing. I think you should start a TikTok about sharpening pencils because you are, that would be so you. <laughs> yeah, I have one in my pantry, which is really the door that's behind me. It was here when we bought the house, but we haven't removed it. I travel <laughs> with an electric pencil sharpener. I'm a huge, I have right here my, my beloved um, colored pencils that I use for editing. I'm a huge 
pencil lady. So if you start that, let me know. I don't. I, I will figure out how to open a TikTok account. I, 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 I'm going to do while I hold a newborn for three weeks. I, I have yet to. I have yet to find one of those old school sharpening pencils that you can install on a wall. Right. <gasps> I but she it. has it. Isn't that what you have, Marissa? Yeah. Oh, I'm a little too scared to open my pantry door right now. But it's right behind me. That's so exciting. Right. Um, this is this is the part of the show where we don't talk about pencils, but we will talk about very serious questions. Uh, okay. Which one of them is, if you weren't doing what you're doing, so, you know, being in the arts, writing all the time, kind of doing all these eclectic, wonderful things, what would you fancy doing for work? Um, I would like to be a rancher. <gasps> I love horses and ranch work, so I would love to be a um, ranch hand. <laughs> what a great answer. <laughs> well, I, I, honestly, like I could just imagine, although I can probably see that. It's funny. I think just kind of, I don't know, it would be just because every day would be different, wouldn't it? And you would kind of be learning something new every day about how to take care of horses, how to take care of the farm. Well, it's just ne necessary work. I mean, the thing with the animals is that, especially large animals like horses or cattle, they just need the same things pretty much every day, you know, shelter, food. It's so sort of like when you're caring for an infant. And I really excelled at that part of mothering, whereas when they needed entertainment and uh, spiritual wow. development on oh, I was like this is too much for me but the 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 feeding and caring and mm -hmm. raking manure and all of that stuff is very methodical and I find it really enjoyable yeah the granular work is yeah. nice. so is there anything that you could share about yourself or your writing process that people might be surprised to know fun Courtney trivia yeah, I feel very called to share it because I, I discovered the terrible news recently that my favorite stationery store, Muji, is filing for bankruptcy. That's where I get all my colored pencils. And I'm sorry, did you not know? Oh, yeah. wow. I guess that means not necessarily that it'll go under, but it it might. So I, I, my writing process is like completely crafted around Muji stationery items. So I've got, they're a little too far back, but I've got these uh, Muji black journals. And mm -hmm. when I'm working on a new project, I fill them up like, blindly with as many notes as I want. And then when I'm done, okay, this is not Muji. This is like a Target crayon. Um, but I use this very item to highlight in yellow the notes that I think are going to make it into the actual book. And then I take a huge piece of uh, watercolor paper. It has to be watercolor. I don't know why. Let's see if you can see this. I've and seen I, Instagram. I love Yeah, it. I, love I fill it. this both sides with um, all the yellow highlighted notes from my Muji journals. And, and so they're already kind of top tier notes. And then I do it again. I take my yellow crayon and I highlight what I think is gonna go into the book. And I do this over and over and over like a filtration system wow. until I memorize the stuff that needs to go in the book and then I can write the book. Wow. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> cool. um, wow. Gosh, I need to really up my game. I'm taking notes. <laughs> um, so the last question uh, has been notoriously difficult for people to answer. I bet you're going to have an answer, though. Um, what is your desert island book? You're only allowed to take one. See, I know I, I don't want people to think that I'm like pulling this out of nowhere. You had mentioned that you might ask me this question. So I came prepared. I put thought into it. And I have decided that it's, um, it is daylight by the poet Arda Collins. So it's poetry. Mm -hmm. oh. And the poems, I met Arda at Breadloaf, I think in 2011. This was a book she won the um, Yale, what do they call it? The Yale Younger Poets Prize, mm -hmm. which is a tr tremendously huge prize. Um, and I just, I read these over all the time. I just don't think there's one novel that could, or book really that I could return to and see new angles and find new angles all the time as much as the poems in this book, which I think actually is going to be a little hard for people to find. It seems like it might be out of print, but work hard and you'll find it. Um, this oh. is just an incredible, so that's what's coming on the desert island with a lot of sunscreen and <laughs> yeah. electrolyte water. <laughs>
It's funny because um, three other authors actually said that they would take poetry because you can always mm -hmm. get into and out of it. Yeah. You can just find something new. Mm -hmm. Well, and you can also use, like I've used some of her lines as jumping off points for short stories and things like that, you know, yeah. whereas it's a little harder to imagine taking some great work of fiction and then yeah. reinvent. I don't know. It's a little. Yeah. yeah. Um, you, I just realized you mentioned bread loaf. Um, I went to Middlebury College. Oh. And I actually did bread loaf in Oxford. Oh, really? Yeah. I didn't, I didn't know they had a program there. Oh, that's neat. Yeah. So they, um, yeah. So they had, um, I did Renaissance. I uh, know I did um, medieval poetry. Um, ah, medieval poetry. When I, I study comparative literature in college and I, I went to France to study Louise Labbé. Oh. Uh, they were not the fondest memories because the French teaching system is pretty hardcore. You know, they wave, um, maybe it's the same in England, they they wave your grades around for all to see and they make fun of your your writing in front of all the other students. Oh, no. yeah. oh, no. That sounds awful. <laughs> it was not, yeah, they're not, it, 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 anyway, it's fine, you're abroad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, medieval poetry, yes, has a special place in my heart. <laughs> yeah. Red Love is a great, it's a great program. Um, yeah. Well, oh my goodness, this has been so great. It's been really nice, nice to speak with you. And I hope everyone will forgive my sheen. I, I, I have no AC and it's like 95 degrees. <laughs> I think we all have it. It's okay, like good. highlighter and <laughs> perfect. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Courtney. Thank you. Thank you. And good luck, everyone, with your writing and your reading. Thanks. That was fantastic. Oh, my goodness. Uh, I, I mean, like I said, I have to up my game. That's a, that's a, that's a lot of well, advice. But I think, do you know what? I think this is the first time we've spoken to an author where I really kind of connect to that way of thinking. I wouldn't be able to do just one thing. And I think that's why, you know, People were asking me, sorry to put myself in this narrative, but like when people were asking me about Motherland, they're like, are you gonna write another novel after this? They're the same, and I was like, actually, I wanna try something different. And I think it's the learning process. I think if you're really open to learn, I think, you know, it's great. You know, anybody who's watching this should just try something, try something new, or try poetry, or try, you know, uh, a collection of essays. It doesn't have to be one thing. Yeah. Like, like you were saying, Marissa, it's like such a, it is a badge, isn't it? It's like, oh, I wrote the great American novel, or I wrote something that's going to be long, long listed on the, you know, for Booker. Mm -hmm. It's just, there's no kind of way to do things. Yeah. Anyway, I've talked everybody's ear off. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's been great having you guys here. Remember, we are on every Friday at 2 p.m. Eastern. Um, so please click the link below to subscribe um, and be uh, alerted ahead of every episode. So, um, yeah, thanks for being here. See you next week. <laughs>